Welcome everyone to our panel today on energy storage and renewables. I'm uh, Harish Kamath. I'm uh, uh, from Electric Power Research Institute. I'll be the moderator today. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I know this is going to be an exciting uh, panel. We, we're, we're competing with some of the other very interesting panels, but you have chosen the right one. <laughs> This one's going to be fun. So um, I'm just going to have a uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to do this from a logistics standpoint. And then I'm going to to uh, let my panelists introduce themselves. Um, just as an initial statement, as you know, what we're what we're here to talk about is energy storage and renewables. Uh, it's a very broad topic. Uh, with uh, with a lot of uh, you know, there are lots of things you can talk about. It's a continent, so we have to restrict ourselves a little bit in what in uh, what we want to discuss. And so today we've decided to discuss uh, the state of energy storage and renewables, particularly with a focus here in California. Uh, a lot of what we say will have applicability in other parts of the country, other parts of the world, uh, but uh, some of it may be unique to California. One of the things that we have in California that we're blessed with is phenomenal solar resource, very mild climate. Uh, those things uh, influence the way that we are going to be able to use renewables uh, in a way that's different from what it might be, for example, in uh, Minnesota or uh, in Texas or New York. So in many ways, you know, we, uh, we had a discussion, you know, lately and uh, recently, and uh, we had, uh, uh, you know, a, a di on a different panel, and, and we noted that, you know, California in many ways uh, is more similar to Spain uh, than it is to, say, New York. Mm -hmm. So although, you know, lessons learned can, can be drawn from what we're talking about here uh, are uh, applicable to a lot of different places, we, uh, uh, we're going to focus a little bit uh, on what we have here. So uh, the way we're going to do this is uh, we have three, uh, my three esteemed colleagues here on the panel uh, are, are going to each give a very short presentation on where they're from and what they're doing in this area. Uh, and then afterwards, we're going to have a number of questions that I'll, I'll start off. And then at the end, I hope to have a few questions from the audience. So uh, please have your questions ready uh, when uh, when we call you up. So uh, my three panel, our three panelists, as you may uh, be aware, uh, Magnus Abo Aspo from uh, um, the, the who is from Solar Edge, uh, and he will be talking. He will be kind of our representative, talking about residential uh, storage and applications. Uh, uh, we have uh, Andres Boris from uh, STEM, uh, who will be talking more about the commercial and industrial uh, aspects of, uh, of of storage and renewables. And then finally, uh, we have Todd Strauss from uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. And Todd will be talking about the uh, effect of, of storage and renewables and how the, the approach to storage and renewables from the utility perspective. So I'm going to start with Magnus and uh, his presentation on this. I will, do you want to come up or are you stay right there? Just take your and get it Next to the Do we have yeah, I just press the clear ah, button. There you go. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, so good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, it's an honor to be here uh, for this conversation about uh, um, storage and the impact on the grid. Um, I know we've been talking about a lot of different things today. Uh, a lot of uh, what I've heard has been policy, and I just want to warn you, I'm a very nuts and bolts kind of person. I started off in uh, uh, as an electrical engineer. I've been taking things apart and putting them together for a long time. Uh, I personally went and got an MBA at a certain point. I've been working on uh, uh, the management side of making things. Can, can you pull the microphone? Like that? You? How's that? Thank you. Okay, I don't want to get in your lap here, but okay. Um, so, uh, um, so my, my, my background is I, I am a head of product marketing for uh, Solar Edge here in uh, North America. Uh, we're the number one um, manufacturer of residential solar inverters in North America. We're now the number two manufacturer of uh, uh, commercial and industrial inverters in North America. It's a global company. Uh, we've uh, shipped over seven and a half gigawatts of, uh, of production capacity. We're uh, in virtually every, uh, every country that has a meaningful grid. Uh, and uh, we're participating in um, storage in combination with solar uh, on a global basis. So an lot, awful lot of exciting things that are happening in North America right now with regard to uh, uh, renewables plus storage, but it fits in as a puzzle piece with, uh, with what's happening on a, uh, on a global scale. Um, 
One thing I wanted to talk about, and I was thinking about this as a uh, as a parable over the weekend, I suppose. I uh, was building a twelve year old a tree house. Uh, it had to be strong uh, and reliable, and uh, above all, safe. Um, so I was there. I had a lot of power tools in order to do that. Uh, spent a lot of money getting uh, the right kind of lumber. Lumber, you know, read up on codes to make sure that it was close as possible. And then all of a sudden. Um, uh, the twelve-year-old came out, and her mom said uh, uh, she wants to help. <laughs> um, and uh, here are her friends, and they want to help too. Uh, and so now, all of a sudden, my job was not just to create something that was strong and reliable, but I had to create rules so that these people wouldn't hurt themselves. And although they were helping, I really appreciated the enthusiasm. They were actually slowing things down a little bit. It feels like this is uh, close to the way the uh, that residential solar had its relationship with the. Uh, uh, with the utilities during its first wave. Uh, really appreciate that the enthusiasm, this is great, but we need to have some rules here uh, because there's a great chance that, uh, um, that by, by participating, you're going to make the situation worse. Uh, so we have put in place rules. Um, and from my point of view, that's, uh, that it, that's nothing but a good thing. At this point, however, uh, renewables have become a, a large enough portion of what's uh, what's happening out there that we need to move beyond the point of of simply uh, uh, benignly allowing them to to be part of the grid. They actually have to participate in a way that's going to be very helpful. Um, we are designating that as smart energy, right? So uh, not only is uh, uh, is solar going to be uh, uh, generated when the sun is out, it's going to be done in an intelligent way. The first part of that has been. Um, putting together uh, rules about how uh, the solar can uh, connect and disconnect from the grid, making it so that it ramps down slowly so that you don't shock the grid, uh, creating um, uh, VARs when uh, that's helpful to the grid, um, and being able to do things autonomously. From our point of view, though, that's a good start. Uh, the next step, however, is that there needs to be greater interaction. That's already foreseen uh, in terms of uh, what the CPUC here in California has uh, has required, where we have to communicate uh, with the with the utility. How exactly that's going to work is going to be fleshed out as time goes on. But we do have the capability to communicate with the utility uh, in order to make things better. But it needs to go a step further, even than that. Uh, and our view is that the next step is, number one, the integration of storage. Um, as uh, Todd will be talking about, there are tremendous problems with the interaction of, of solar when the uh, uh, solar generation when the sun is out versus consumption, which happens when everybody comes home and the sun goes down. Uh, so storage is a, a key part of, of uh, creating smart energy from a renewable resource. Um, the other part of it is... Uh, um, is interacting with consumption. So up until now, solar has been operating and generating energy completely independently of what happens to be going on inside of the household at the moment. And we see that that's going to be changing over time as we uh, start deploying smart energy solutions that include uh, that include storage at the residential level. Um, it's going to take us, from our point of view, three things in order to achieve that. Outs and these none, none of these three things are uh, probably the most important things, which is policy making and uh, and laws. But uh, but from a technical point of view, the in the inverters, the electronics have to get more intelligent. The good news is that that's that's already happened. There is an excess of uh, of uh, um, uh, CPU processing capability on these uh, devices. They can do an awful lot of very intelligent things but they also need to be able to communicate intelligently with the network and in a safe and secure fashion. Um, and then in addition, we need to be able to create systems where it's not just the, uh, the inverter uh, creating energy in, in, uh, um, uh, in, uh, in absence of any knowledge about what's going on in the household. You need to be able to combine all of those capabilities into one box so that they are coordinated. So for instance, if you have an excess of PV generation in the household, you might want to have Want, might want to have a command to put it someplace, uh, put it into a battery so, for use later. Or if you happen to have an electric water heater, take that moment to uh, preheat the water or take that moment to pre-cool the house before everybody gets home. There's an awful lot of things that can be done in order to uh, take mere energy and turn it into something intelligent that's helping to stabilize the grid. The third thing that needs to happen is this interaction, and this uh, interaction amongst all of the, uh, the assets to create uh, what's been popularly called a virtual power plant. This is happening now. Uh, we are doing this with uh, several utilities actively uh, around the globe. Um, we're doing this right now uh, in pilots 
uh, here in the United States. And I actually got off the, the phone this morning with a utility that would very much like to do a more, more extended pilot where they would be co co-locating storage with uh, uh, residential solar and then commanding it all at once so that they can um, offset the impacts of wind. So you would actually be using solar co-located storage as a way of storing excess energy from wind, which means that it needs to be dispatched very fast. So these are all things that technologically there is no issue. We know how to do this. Um, so the next step is primarily, as I alluded to, coming up the policy and working directly with, uh, um, uh, with utilities in order to uh, make these things happen. Um, but, uh, but we're ready. And uh, as I said, I'm, I'm mostly a nuts and bolts kind of guy. So uh, 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 keep your questions towards me towards that. And uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Magnus. Next, I will um, next I will let uh, Andres talk briefly about his. Yeah. So here. Just drive it from here. Uh, so, uh, so uh, STEM is uh, about a let's call it a nine years old company, privately owned. Um, we raised. Uh, uh, 80 million dollar uh, as around uh, D in earlier this year very well f uh, financed uh, the business is going very well uh, this slide was uh, uh, created uh, I think last week and I sent to you and uh, that time we had about 416 slides I said that was last week this week we have probably over 400 tonne. Um, the energy capacity in this week probably what we installed is over 50 megawatts and uh, probably around uh, uh, 900 megawatt hours. And most of the system that we are deploying it's a, a tour uh, system and uh, we are in the CNI uh, uh, market uh, behind the meter uh, deploying our primary market is California, but we have Hawaii, New York, Texas, Massachusetts, uh, Japan, and, and Canada. Canada is, is became a very hot uh, market for us. Um, we deliver value uh, not just uh, uh, for the business and, and, and government customers, but uh, utilities and ISOs. Um, and uh, I don't really want to go into details because we will talk about later with the, uh, uh, the panel. But uh, primarily, we are using mach uh, machine learning uh, algorithms, uh, uh, AI bagged in the runs in the uh, cloud uh, with the very accurately uh, forecasting uh, load based on weather information and, and other uh, method methodology inputs that we get, historical data, uh, usage data. So we can uh, basically provide uh, savings both for the, uh, the customers on site as well as we have uh, uh, helping the utilities. Uh, how do we help the utilities? Uh, if you take a look at what is the difference between a peaker and the storage, we can, uh, I don't want to say that eliminate the peakers, but we can uh, substitute or we can help the utilities so they don't have to build uh, new peakers. Uh, the uh, the storage, uh, uh, lithium ion storage or, or battery storage is clean, uh, is renewable, has no uh, carbon footprint, so has all the advantage that basically you know, we are talking about all day long here um, uh, we participate in the uh, uh, LCR uh, with uh, Southern California Edison uh, and uh, that's a interactive interactive uh, grid program that basically uh, SE tells us that when and how much energy they need and we, we basically discharge that energy what's helping to the utility that they don't have to uh, uh, build extra infrastructure uh, when they are short of the, uh, the grid supply they don't have to bring in the uh, uh, the peakers and uh, uh, basically they save them a lots of uh, money just because a few times in a year or a few times in a month they need the extra energy uh, the company has a, a contract for 85 megawatts with SE, and we have similar uh, programs with the other uh, major California utilities also. Um, from the uh, uh, 
CNI's point of view, and you can take a look to this chart. Uh, Todd, turn around. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, uh, what uh, the company is paying is, is, is the, uh, 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 the power, how much power they get, and that's a significantly more uh, expensive than the energy. You can see in the chart in the last uh, 10 years, uh, the price is, is going up, and uh, we, basically, we can provide uh, the peak shaving that uh, uh, provides uh, uh, the big savings uh, to the customers. This is just an example uh, for uh, one of the uh, uh, school that we uh, installed the 600 kilowatt system. And uh, you can see in the chart that uh, we are basically saving uh, uh, on the uh, power side significant amount, shaving their peak, and that, that saves the schools. And basically, it, uh, they have a, a payback uh, in several years. Uh, usually, we have a 10 years uh, uh, contract. And uh, today, we can have a, a installed site that basically is profitable even without government subsidies or, or the uh, other incentives uh, programs. Thank you, Anders. And finally, um, Todd, do you want to speak from there? Um, sure. Just pass the, the get. Do you have it? California is doing marvelous things. And PG&E is aligned with California's vision in fighting climate change. It's all about providing clean energy affordably while maintaining safety and reliability. So for those of you counting here, that's an eight-dimensional problem. Right? Safety, reliability, affordability, cleanness in time and space. Let alone what are the metrics for cleanness and the dimensionality sub-dimensionality they're in. So that's one of the reasons why I and most of you in this room are really interested in these kinds of issues and working in energy. Before I hand it back to Haresh and we really go into the details of the panel, I just want to check on three things. Who here is a PG customer? If you're a PG customer, raise your hand. All right. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I appreciate you. PG&E appreciates you and is working 24-7, 365, some years 366, to make sure you get safe, reliable, affordable, clean energy. Okay. Second, who here is from the California Public Utilities Commission? Raise your hand. I don't see any hands. No one. Okay, it makes it a little easier because actually I have very strict reporting requirements <laughs> with respect to the California Public Utilities Commission and uh, depending upon who from the commission might be here, but not an issue at this moment. <laughs> if, if someone walks in from the commission, it's a different matter. Okay. Third, who here has heard of the duck chart? Raise your hand. Oh, uh, many. <laughs> I'm not sure about most, but many. Okay, great. Um, and so I uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about the duck chart. And so it's a forecast. It's a forecast that was originally made in 2012 by the California Independent System Operator. This picture here is from 2014, okay, and it represents a typical day in March, and the horizontal axis is our hours from midnight to midnight, and the vertical axis is net load. And that's not demand, that's net load. So what's load? Think of it as meter load. And so that's not exactly usage, because it's like, well, it's what would be consumed, right, minus what doesn't get consumed because of energy efficiency, and what doesn't get metered because it's actually being met by resources that are behind the meter, like solar rooftop, okay? So that's, that's kind of, you know, important what meter load is. And then net load is that minus utility scale wind minus utility scale solar. And so the point is, wow, this looks like the duck in particular. We have 2012 actuals. This is from 2014. We have 2012 actuals. 
And then we have 2013 actuals, and each year kind of the belly of the duck gets a little bit lower and lower and lower. So the forecast is in 2014 was for 2040, uh, 2020, right? They're to be in the middle of the day. Not that much demand in March and a lot of solar, and so it's pretty low, okay? But yet by the time the sun goes down, you know, demand kind of gets back up. You know, the, the resources are, you know, going away, and so the net demand's higher. So there's this ramp, this long neck of the duck. And so these are some of the challenges. There's a whole menagerie of animals throughout the year, okay? <laughs> this is one of the challenges. So here's where we are in California. Okay. And this year, the neck of the duck was not the forecast for 2020 of 10,000. The neck of the duck was almost 15,000 megawatts. And what was the belly of the duck? Not... 10,000 or so, the forecast for 2020, it was a little bit more than 7,000 megawatts, the net load, in the middle of the day. So we're already, you know, the forecast in 2014 for 2020, we're beyond that now in 2018. So these are some of the challenges now in managing the grid to make sure you, our customers, get safe, reliable, affordable, clean energy in time and space. 360. 365, 24-7. So with that, let me now hand it back to Resh. We can get into some of the details a little. <laughs> great. Thanks, Todd. That was a great explanation. Um, so what we're going to talk about, um, I think, in, in the next few, uh, and, and what we're going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can blank out the screen here so it's not a distraction for us. Um, so um, what we're going to talk about in the next few, in the next few minutes um, is how we address this issue because this, as you can see, I mean, renewables is a thing. It's real. It's really happening. We're really seeing it all across California. It's uh, a real opportunity. It is a real deployment, and it is a challenge in some respects. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things is about just the planning process. Historically, uh, the electric power industry has been very heavily planned, and they look at these things years in advance to try to understand what the load's going to be, uh, and they try to create a, uh, a arrangement by which uh, we know how to build and where to build assets and who builds those assets. Uh, that's become complicated, not just because uh, it's not only the utility building it anymore, now we have a bunch of 12-year-olds on the grid. Um, but now, what? so how do we do this in the future? How is this going to happen? And, and what I'd like to ask is, I'd like, Todd, if you could start out from the utility pers perspective, how does this begin? Uh, and then I'd like to add, I'd like to ask Magnus and, and Andres, how do the 12-year-olds help? <laughs> going to make me regret that analysis. <laughs> <laughs> so just want to point out a couple things to keep it rolling. And so, you know, no doubt, right? 20th century marvel of engineering the electric grid, right? Yes, it's an engineering marvel. Actually, the 21st or early 21st century version is actually not just an engineering marvel, it's an institutional mar mar marvel. It's a sociological marvel. There are many different entities who are engaged. It's not a monolithic, vertically integrated utility in control. Certainly not in California, and it hasn't been for more than 20 years. And so we have a variety of different entities. So even when we talk about the grid, you know, there's a, the role of the California Independent System Operator, mm -hmm. focusing on the bulk power grid. And then pg e does various things to maintain reliability and operate distribution grids. And a key challenge that we're now focusing on is not just renewables or, or solar, but it's distributed energy, right? So it's not just large wind farms and large solar power plants out in San Luis Obispo County, right? It's a whole bunch of, it's orders of magnitude more units and resources deployed on our roofs, uh, in parking garages, um, in, in micro uh, deployments in neighborhoods. And so that just becomes a whole different kind of problem of scale and how to think about this time space issue. And so that's one of the key facets of the, the character of, of the problem and issue challenge that we have in California today, because California has really embraced that. We have 900,000, uh, solar PV units in California. 
for about 6.7 gigawatts, 6,700 megawatts. So that's a little bit, uh, maybe that's about 8% of the total, uh, California, you know, deployed resources. Um, and so that's, it's beginning to be mind boggling. So PG&E um, in 2017, 33% uh, energy delivered, uh, renewables provided to customers, and we deliver even more, 80% carbon free. Big challenges. So how do we handle that? And so, you know, our institutions are beginning to fray because they were designed in the 20th century, not the 21st century. Over to you, Max. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, I mean, one of the things that we can that that can help out here, I think, is as you said, uh, partnerships, effective partnerships, and maybe one of them uh, are the inverters that you talked about, Magnus, and and uh, uh, and especially, you know, is that is that something that's a partial solution to um, to the to 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 this approach to to the the issues that we're facing with with massive uh, adoption? Um, to a certain extent, I mean, uh, first of all, just to parse it a little bit. An, an inverter by its nature is doing a very simple thing. It's just taking DC and turning it into AC, but it usually comes with control capability. Uh, and it's really the control capability that we're talking about here. Uh, and especially the control capability when we combine it with with storage, with uh, with site, uh, uh, site deployed, deployed storage behind the meter. Uh, the reason we think that that's a good idea is, number one, it uh, um, allows it allows you to take that energy that would be at the belly of the curve, um, and uh, you know that you're that because you have an overabundance of PV, and to use it in the evening. That's that's number one. But the fact that it's dis dispatchable once you actually get that communication in place, so that it's dispatchable by the utility, all of a sudden you can um, fix a host of other issues. Uh, uh, here's here's an example. Right now we're seeing in uh, uh, in Hawaii, which has got an abundance of solar. Uh, and great big fat puffy white clouds. A cloud comes over parts of Hawaii and all of a sudden all the diesel generators are just grunting and grinding trying to keep up. Uh, the fact that you can now dispatch batteries in order to make up for that solves certain problems locally that are affecting the grid, grid uh, globally. Um, and uh, as I said, the ability to simply uh, move energy back and forth within uh, the distribution area is very useful. There is a limit to it. I mean, the reality is, is that our local distribution areas are not designed to uh, take energy that's uh, that's uh, uh, here in Palo Alto and move it to Fremont. It's just it's not set up to do that. And there are, there are certain uh, structural problems that we have. So as long as we look at solving the problems within local areas, there's an awful lot of possibility uh, in order to allow the utility to uh, um, to use storage as a way to solve both local problems and global problems. One of the tricks that we've all got to figure out though is how to do that without antagonizing the consumer. So the example I like to take is uh, uh, is the Nest thermostat, right? Here's a device that uh, uh, nobody had done much innovation on for, for a couple of decades. And all of a sudden, a company comes in, makes it smart, but also makes it very attractive, very easy to use, very unobtrusive. Uh, and all of a sudden, not only is it being deployed widely, they're getting higher revenue for it. So I think that people are willing to pay in order to participate in something that is uh, that is going to be useful for the grid, as long as it doesn't inconvenience them, uh, and the control capabilities that we're trying to build into these devices in order to do that need to focus on that. It needs to be very very simple, and just sit there quietly, saving people money and making things better without uh, really impinging on people's lives. That's uh, I think that's I think this is particularly com compelling. Uh, also, from a business perspective, you know, residential consumers will certainly appreciate that there's no impact on their on their lives. But business, uh, I think, business customers will want more of a solid value proposition. So maybe Andres, you can tell us about that and why they would want to put an energy storage system behind the meter that would help the grid in addition to maybe provide some service to them. So l let me start with the batteries. Um, Two years ago, uh, this, the systems what we uh, installed, it had uh, seven cabinets, like 19-inch cabinets, and it had a uh, uh, capacity of uh, about 100 kilowatt, uh, kilowatt hours. Last year, uh, we installed a system that had uh, about five cabinets, and uh, the capacity was about 235 uh, kilowatt hours. This year, in a few months that we are going to install uh, the next uh, uh, system that has uh, basically two cabinets and uh, 
uh, the capacity is about uh, half of what was a five cabinet. So my point is that uh, the battery technology is, is improving. Uh, it's uh, the footprint is shrinking, and that's a big thing for the, uh, uh, the commercial because they don't have the uh, the place to install it. Uh, what happens that for the same uh, real estate, we can install higher capacity uh, and with the higher capacity, we can provide more value. And uh, as, as uh, 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 what's your name? Magnus. We've only known each other. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, indicated that uh, controlling this asset centrally, uh, basically, we can uh, help the utilities, we can help uh, uh, to uh, basically put a uh, uh, diet on the uh, dock uh, by uh, discharging the batteries in the middle of the day uh, having the uh, the very intelligent uh, and what stem is doing that we have a local control and we have a control in in the uh, cloud the two things works together so we can have very accurate uh, forecasting then uh, what we need to uh, discharge uh, the energy and uh, basically helping both the customer uh, reducing their uh, i mean the uh, the bill and the same time helping the utilities and the iso uh, uh, <coughs> shrinking the belly great so i mean it sounds like it sounds a lot like from what from what you're saying that energy storage is integrally linked to the renewable growth in california and any future renewables growth that we have has to be coupled with energy storage or maybe i'm reading too much into that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell me why todd sure <laughs> right and so the challenges we've identified okay the point is there are many different kinds of potential solutions okay so you know, energy storage is one of them um, and putting smart inverters on solar uh, feathering the blades of wind turbines uh, demand side solutions, pricing solutions for customers, load management, um, having a wider geographical footprint in which to integrate the grid. So not just California, but let's go to Oregon and uh, the west uh, western part of the United States. Um, possibly even gas-fired peakers if the gas were renewable gas. So there are many different kinds of potential solutions to these issues of dealing with the system with the grid. And so the question becomes, well, what are their characteristics? And how they, at the end of the day, what's it going to cost? Great. That's a, I think that's, that's a good answer. So we all know energy storage is going to be the best one, though. So tell us, <laughs> tell us Magnus, you know, what, so my, my contention maybe uh, from what I heard so far is that the only question about energy storage is where it goes. Is it going to go behind the meter or is it going to be owned by the utility somewhere? So Magnus, tell us why residential storage is the best place to put energy storage. So I think that there are an awful lot of advantages to uh, to locating uh, storage uh, residentially. I don't think it's the only place that it needs to be located, but there are there are a lot of advantages to doing it there. Essentially, if you're consuming energy at a location uh, where you generated that energy, that means that the net impact on the uh, uh, on the uh, the distribution net network is is zero, right? So if you uh, if we do that, there's an awful lot of benefit to be gained by simply not having to. Uh, uh, having to uh, uh, invest in the distribution area. There's a couple of places where storage is being used now residentially um, as a requirement. Um, this is in the APS territory where they're doing using it in order to uh, make it so that they can actually avoid investing in the uh, in the in the network overall. Um, those uh, situations come up fairly frequently. I mean, all of us know that there are more people piling into our most populated areas uh, and uh, investing in, in the existing infrastructure isn't necessarily attractive. Um, having a uh, co-located uh, storage with, uh, with solar actually uh, resolves part of that uh, quite nicely. It also does solve another problem for the consumer, uh, which is that if you have a storage device on, on site, you can also have backup power. Uh, so if there is any uh, uh, grid unreliability, and I lived in PG&E territory, and it's not that bad. It's pretty good here in California. Out in, on the East Coast, up in the woods, it's pretty bad. Vermont, New Hampshire, you get a lot of snow, falling trees. So here it's pretty good. But people are still extremely attracted to the idea that uh, 
uh, that they have energy if, uh, for whatever reason, the grid goes away. And again, this is actually a proposition that people have shown time and again that they're willing to pay for. So they are willing to subsidize the cost of the battery um, in order to have that, uh, that backup capability. So that's, that, that's a huge help. So in, to, in my opinion, it's, it does matter where you put the storage is going to help. Uh, I think there is room for the uh, uh, next to the, uh, uh, the solar plants uh, for the utilities. There is definitely room and, and a good business case uh, to uh, <clears throat> behind the meter for CNI as well as residential. Uh, as your storage is bigger, probably it's less expensive per kilowatt hours. So the what I see that uh, the residential uh, business is probably harder to justify today. Uh, the CNI, it's probably it's in a break-even uh, today, average, and uh, uh, the least least expensive is uh, the utility uh, scale storage when you install 20, 40, 100 megawatt hours. Uh, probably you guys read about uh, uh, Tesla installed 100 megawatt hours in Australia. Mm -hmm. Right in hundred days, that was was a marketing ploy. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's it's. Uh, I I think there's a future. The price is co coming down, uh, and it's going to help the utilities and and the residentials. I think Todd uh, is eager to say so. Something. I just want to check in, right? So when you're talking about stores, uh, Andrews, you're talking about batteries, right? I'm focusing on batteries, but okay. there are other storages okay. that. Uh, Great. And, yeah. uh, you know, Magnus, when you're thinking about storage, you're thinking about batteries? Residentially, yes. Okay. I'm a battery guy. <laughs> Although you will allow that uh, one other type of storage that we see a lot of hope for is, is thermal storage, so hot mm -hmm. water heat. Right. And I think it's important to recognize even energy storage is actually a pretty wide, diversified class yeah. of, of resources, right? from small lithium ion batteries mm -hmm. in uh, consumer electronics to deployment uh, behind the meter. We talked about utility scale. It's largely the same technology. Uh, lithium ion batteries is just kind of aggregated together, but they're lead acid batteries. There are other kinds of batteries. Um, there's compressed air. You can take air and put it into a, a, a pit underground and use that in and out to, uh, to, to generate electricity. There's some efficiency loss, but again, the reason why we're doing this is that there's some economic benefit that overcomes mm -hmm. that physical efficiency loss. And of course, there's pump storage, right? Which is, you know, a hundred year old technology, right? And PGE has a 1200 megawatt pump storage facility, uh, you know, built in the 1980s, you know, in, uh, up in the Sierras. And so even energy storage is a wide variety of technologies. I think it's important to keep that in mind. Yeah, you have a point. So do you think, uh, Todd, that uh, utilities are interested in owning storage or, or being a part of it? Or are you more interested in coordinating storage that's that's uh, behind the meter? So most importantly, want to deliver to you, our customers, safe, reliable, <laughs> affordable, clean energy. And so the question is, you know, how to do that, right? Where's the energy come from? Because storage in and itself doesn't produce energy. It's actually a net consumer of energy. Sometimes it produces, at other times, right, it consumes. And so we need to think about, so where's the energy coming from for that? By and large, again, storage is one choice among many. We tend to be kind of technology agnostic. California policy has a clear preference for certain kinds of energy resources rather than others, mm -hmm. right? for energy efficiency and demand response and conservation and renewables and distributed generation rather than gas-fired power plants or coal plants or nuclear plants. And California policy has a particular preference today for certain kinds of energy storage, relatively small-scale distributed storage, whether it's in front of the meter or behind the meter, Okay, and the intent isn't because it's so cost effective today. California's stated intent is to transform the marketplace. Okay, so by spending a bit more today, you, our customers, and everyone else in California, right, we're basically trying to stimulate the market so that costs, we talk about costs, will be much lower tomorrow when we need to deploy it and when the world needs to deploy far greater quantities of it to integrate the massive amounts of renewables into the grid. And so the key question is, what's that cost trajectory? 
because when we look at solar pan PV panels, you know, in 2006, the forecast was, you know, $4.50 a watt. And, you know, it looks like a lot of other technologies then seem more promising for renewables. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, our customers, have benefited from Chinese subsidies and federal tax credits for solar PV and the California Solar Initiative. And so we've done that in California. We were kind of third. Germany and Spain were one and two going first. On storage in California, we're going first worldwide. And so the question is, you know, this is the... Hundred billion dollar question or more worldwide, right? Is you know what will that cost curve look like? If it looks like what happened in solar PV, more storage, and you know there are lots of opportunities for every one of us, all three panelists, all of you to participate in the value chain, to own, deploy, and so forth. If the cost curve looks like oh it doesn't decrease like that, if we don't get a Moore's law for store energy storage, hey maybe customer pricing programs and uh, the some of the other kinds of technologies may be more promising to do this renewable integration that we've been talking about. Right. So so Magnus, can you talk about the cost reduction and uh, what you're seeing on your end in terms of? How, uh, how costs are falling and whether they're falling at the rate that uh, Todd thinks they should? Um, so certainly we've seen a huge reduction in, uh, um, in the cost of PV. And pr primarily that's been because of, the, as I was talking about, things that have happened in China and their enormous investment in, uh, in plants there. And then subsequent overproduction and, and uh, things that we uh, now consider to be dumping. And, uh, um, and, uh, uh, but the end result is that you know, what used to cost several dollars just for the raw uh, raw solar uh, capacity on the uh, on the uh, on the panel now is you know a fraction of a dollar. Uh, I don't personally expect to see that, and, and now now this is a, a personal view and not a solar edge view. I don't personally expect to see that um, for for batteries for a uh, uh, to the same extent for the simple reason that we're going to have one positive thing, which is that we're riding the uh, uh, the coattails of transportation, right? You know, the uh, the Tesla battery uh, uh, that you buy for, uh, for your house is largely the same as the Tesla battery that goes inside of a Model X. Uh, so the good news is that all of that investment is going into pushing down that cost curve. Uh, however, we won't see the same thing that we saw in PV, which is that massive overproduction, because there is strong demand for uh, uh, for lithium ion batteries. So that's, that's going to continue on. Uh, we are seeing a continuous downward movement in the uh, in the cost of uh, um, uh, lithium ion, uh, in the same way that you're seeing it in the uh, the transportation sector. But the reality is is that within um, certainly for residentially located storage, a lot of the costs are not the pure chemistry; it's the it's the other components, um, and uh, uh, to the to the tune of you know three, four, sometimes even five times the uh, the cost of the chemistry is actually represented by uh, uh, by the other parts. That's where we're working on it. Okay, so we're you know from our point of view, we're pushing down the cost of those compo components. Now all of a sudden we get to uh, uh, get involved with uh, with things like uh, ASICs and you know following actually components that do subscribe to Moore's law. So the cost of uh, of the ancillary components to uh, deliver that chemistry on site uh, is coming down, and we do expect that to come down over time. Anders, do you agree with that assessment? Partially. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mo most of the industry uh, experts and and uh, they predict uh, a continuous uh, price uh, uh, reduction. Uh, maybe I mean we're not talking about Moore's law, but the ten twenty percent per year. Yeah. Uh, the issue is uh, uh, with the and when we're talking about storage, I'm talking about Magnus talking about lithium ion. We're not, not talking about you know, molten salt or, or compressed air. Um, <clears throat> the issue is with the lithium ion batteries that uh, the supply chain. Cobalt is manuf I mean, manufactured, it's, it's, it's mined in Congo. Congo, it's, uh, it's not a stable uh, country. Uh, and uh, the processing of the cobalt, 90% happens in China. So it's a limited power, I mean, limited supply, and uh, the EV uh, industry has a much higher demand and clot. So when there is a short supply, uh, the EV industry is going to get the uh, uh, basically the batteries, not the uh, the energy storage. And uh, we have seen in the past uh, that 
actually a certain uh, manufacturer raise the price versus uh, dropping the price. It's it's not the general uh, tendency. Uh, and uh, the benefit in the CNI that our install car, I mean, the, uh, the installation, the permitting is not five or four X, it's uh, probably, uh, I would say f between 30 to 40% of the total cost. So uh, there is room for improvement on that one, if the utilities can help us, um, <laughs> uh, and, and, and the local authorities. So it's definitely is, is, a, is a policy issue to, to make the permitting uh, easier and, and faster and less expensive. And uh, at the same time, I think the hardware cost, chemical, uh, the chemistry is probably coming down in a, a 10 to 20% per year. I, I, just, I just want to follow up on that because I think that's exactly right, Andres, is that, in fact, a good portion of the cost, as Magnus Andres have described, it, it's not so much the technology at this point, right? It goes back to their policy-driven costs, right? What's the cost to permit and install and interconnect and, and the specs? And, you know, there, there are a variety of things that are not just the components to get to full deployment. And so, you know, what does that cost? And... uh you know, what's the benefit? And we've talked about benefits to residential customers, commercial industrial customers. And so, you know, there's also, there's the financing benefits to those customers who install, right? And then there's the economic benefits or costs, right, to the overall system. Because we can actually have deployment by a customer and they can basically save off their particular pricing structure, the tariff, which has a demand charge. Mm -hmm. But the overall economic deployment and the cost for that storage may actually be inefficient relative to something else. And so, you know, economic efficiency is one of the things the utility and our regulators are really keen about. <coughs> and so it's, it's, it's more than just, okay, here's the price and what's it going to cost for a particular customer. And what does it look like for overall customers and particular customer segments and the fairness and allocation to between who pays and who doesn't. Because, you know, it, that's a, at the end of the day, who pays and who doesn't is a, at the heart of a lot of these cost issues right now. So if I may, um, th th there is another issue that helping uh, this industry. It's, it is not just the cost curve is coming down, but actually the better is getting better. But it, what does it mean that we have more cycles? Uh, a few years ago, you had a thousand cycles. Today we can get batteries with two or three thousand cycles. That means that the lifespan of, of the battery is extended, which means that uh, uh, you have a longer life sp lifespan. It's not five years, but ten years or maybe fifteen years. Uh, we are not brave enough at this point that uh, to sell fifteen years storage. But I think in a few years we will see that the storage is going up to fifteen years. Same way as the solar started probably 15 years and after went up to 20 and 25 years or even today may have a 30 years warranty mm -hmm. on solar panels that sounds really promising <laughs> so it sounds like um despite my best efforts that my panelists are all agreeing with each other which is um <laughs> sounds <laughs> i said it sounds promising <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and to some extent you know i mean one of the things with pg we're trying to figure out like how does this actually work Right. So we actually have a, a few deployments and pilots. We own some, some batteries. Uh, we tried to put them on the grid. We were the first to actually connect to the ISO's real time market and try to bid it into that wholesale market. I mean, there are just so many of these. Again, it's this complicated technological institutional interface that really is going to lead to success in California. And that's why I keep going back to policy is mm -hmm. at the heart and successful policy is, is going to, is what's going to help California help us get to our goals right so that's a that's actually i mean a really good segue into the question you know what is the future of the policy in california what you know given that um you know maybe costs are not coming down as fast as we'd like them to uh, although there are many things that that are very promising uh and you know there are so many other options out there you know so there's so many other technical approaches to this thing um you know what what uh, what is the Cal what is the state of california going to do what should the Cal state of california do yeah. Interesting, you're looking at me to represent the, the state of California. So I'm not going to represent the state of California, but I just want to point out a, a, a couple of things, right? So actually, it's actually a good thing that we have uh, some diversity and lots of pilots and trials, right? Because it basically picking a technological winner, you know, that's not the United States. That's definitely not California, okay? That's uh, 
defunct system. Okay. Um, but the question is, what can we do to nudge things along in certain kinds of ways? What can we do to promote things? And, you know, there are examples of good policy and bad policy. Okay. Um, so trying to pick a technological winner, that's going to be bad policy. If we decided in 2006 that, uh, you know, linear, uh, solar thermal was the, the winner, it's like we never would have gotten this. You know, we never would have gotten what we have today in telecommunications. So the question is, how do we have lots of small bets, right? And lots of small losses. And then we actually learn a lot, right? So you think about this as a dynamic learning problem, you know? How do we structure that? That's really hard in the policy space to structure things so that there are lots of small bets and a lot of learning before big bets are plunked down. You know, where's the ribbon cutting for that tiny pilot? Ribbon cuttings are for big, you know, massive programs. And the challenge is when, you know, keep going in a certain direction when the signals point elsewhere. The issue is actually cutting off the losers early enough. It's not that they're losers. It's about learning about it and cutting off those losers learn early enough and moving to places that seem more promising kind of on the margin. So I, I try to think of this as can we do lots of small, frequent, incremental things and learn. That's really hard in the policy space. So uh, from the industry point of view, what I see that if we can offer more, more value to the customer, uh, we can uh, assure the uh, the wide scale adaptation. What kind of? I mean, there are several ways that you can uh, create revenue from a storage. Um, there are a few of them that uh, makes no sense. It's and paper looks good, but uh, one of the thing that uh, that was another panel earlier talking about the microgrids and and uh, basically UPS and and, and providing the. Uh, uh, power for the essential uh, resources. This definitely gives more value. I mean, you, you can consider that you save money because of your bill. Uh, you can participate in the uh, uh, eliminating some peakers or helping the uh, dock uh, uh, shrinking. And the top of it, when uh, you have a power outage, which is fortunately we don't have very very often in, in uh, uh, the pg and territory. I'm glad but, you guys have experienced good service. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, uh, it's basically like buying an insurance policy. I mean, we, we heard a few examples how much uh, uh, economic damage can uh, uh, cause by a few hours of, of power outage or, or a hospital or a fire station and things like that. If you can provide, the, you know, the storage provides the power for the few hours that has a tremendous value and, and that again just can justify the investments what the, the customers have to put in. And, you know, this is, again, a, it becomes a challenging sociological problem. Mm -hmm. Who here owns a house? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Who here has earthquake insurance on your house? Keep your hand up. Okay. okay. So, you know, maybe a fifth, you know. And so, you know, why do you have earthquake insurance or why do you do not? Right. Why does one s install a microgrid or not? Right. And, you know, what are those preferences and what is one assuming about what happens in that kind of catastrophe? And what can we learn from the experiences in California, but also from Superstorm Sandy or what's happened to Puerto Rico? Right. In, in terms of the resilience needed. And so I talk about, you know, safe and reliable. And so, you know, when we think about climate change, resilience really becomes the dimensionality in which that, that shows up in the 21st century. And we're really trying to rethink that. What does that mean for customers? What does that mean for the grid? And so, again, that's one where lots of promise for storage, and we're trying to check it out. It goes back to the end of the day, what's, what are the benefits as well as what does it cost? You know, and there are a multiple set of benefits. I appreciate, you know, Andres, you're really – careful and not double counting certain things and you know you know there's been a lot of work out there on benefits of storage um and uh a varying quality shall we say and so you know the, you know, getting a good quality curated work actually that is an opportunity for for those you're interested you know to kind of demonstrate that and really test out what are those benefits and how to, and under different market circumstances they get greatly different value we need to recognize that Roses cost more close to Valentine's, just before Valentine's Day, compared to just after Valentine's Day, you know? And so a power plant that's providing energy is really valuable towards the height of that duck on the neck, but really 
It's actually negatively priced. You should pay to stay on the grid, and fo folks actually do. In the middle of the day, about 5% of hours uh, in the first six months of 2017 were negatively priced. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the real time. So it's like people are paying to stay on the grid with their power plants. And so storage has a real opportunity in that space to, to kind of provide a balancing. And the question is, does it pan out those benefits and the prices relative to the cost? Great. I'm going to open it up for any uh, audience questions that uh, might be out there. If you want to come up to the mic uh, and just ask a question, then uh, cover it in an orderly way, please. John Mashing. Uh, actually, two quick questions. One is, what effects do you see from the 2020 uh, net zero housing uh, rules okay, that are coming? And, and the second is, um, I don't know if people have visited the central energy facility over here uh, at Stanford with giant tanks of hot and cold water and very very sophisticated computer modeling. And I'm just curious if you're seeing that um, the use of um, uh, uh, storage that's heat, heat and cold storage showing up in other places, it, like campus size things, industry, or, or in homes. I want to take the second question first. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a stab at the uh, at the net zero home. So oh, okay. I, think, I think you're mostly speaking about Title 24 changes. Um, so. As an industry, we're, we're processing that, honestly. The, uh, to my knowledge, the, uh, the primary thing that we're seeing is that as we start to work with home builders, they are um, an interesting lot. They uh, um, are extremely cost conscious. Uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, the profit margin on building a house in California isn't very good. <laughs> Uh, so their uh, their desire is uh, is hyper economic. They are going to do exactly what they need in order to meet the uh, meet the title, and they probably aren't going to do more unless homeowners demand it and are willing to pay additional. Uh, so what that means for us in the near term is that we're seeing smaller solar. So all the houses will probably have some sort of solar system on them, but they'll be smaller. Um, the uh, requirements around uh, combining that with uh, 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 with storage, however, I don't see any in there unless somebody can has read farther than I have and 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 can point to it. So right now, you have a, a situation where uh, where Title Twenty Four is going to require essentially more PV, but there's not a requirement for storage uh, to go along with it, which is, from my point of view, a little unfortunate. Um, you do get credits for uh, combined heating and cooling, so there's a desire for heat pump water heaters combined with air conditioning, and those are all good things. Um, but, uh, but from my point of view, it could go a little bit farther. And, and you know, one of the key elements is zero net over what time period, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this goes back to, you know, the role of the grid, right, transmission and distribution <laughs> in integrating this because basically the more houses we'll see like this, we'll actually see more two-way flow, more customers with two-way flow, sometimes sending power onto the grid and whatnot. And so that just becomes, you know, again, it wasn't originally designed that way in the 20th century, but it becomes a, a 21st century challenge that we're facing now and that Hawaii is definitely faced and, you know, that we're in trying to integrate integrate these issues and you know these resources into the grid so I, I haven't seen the Stanford I would love to see it <laughs> okay and uh, but uh, there are other storage technologies that used by like grocery stores or they they using pre-chilling and just and creating ice at night and and basically mm -hmm. pumping into the air conditioner and, and things like that uh, hi, Bennett Myers, uh, Stanford Slack National Lab. Um, Andres, you talked about one of the important factors being the increase in battery lifetime in terms of number of cycles. We've gone from 1,000 to two to 3,000 over the last few years. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the challenges of um, dealing with battery lifetime in like an energy management system context mm -hmm. with renewables where you're not doing these nice charges up and down. Um, like how should we think about lifetime, particularly when that's mm -hmm. kind of the published data is these number of cycles, we may not actually ever see cycles like that. <laughs> that that's a good question. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I, I used to have dark hair a year ago. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's really very challenging because, uh, uh, and basically what I'm dealing with is series of warranty issues. Uh, negotiating and dealing with the uh, manufacturers. Manufacturers uh, accept that you, you keep the battery in 50% SOC and say you make one charge, uh, a full cycle, which of course shouldn't be 100%, maybe between 20 and 80 or <laughs> let's say uh, 10 and 90, and after keep it in 50% and they give you 3,000 cycles, right? That's not reality. 
and and the other thing that they're asking us that please provide us a a typical profile okay <laughs> we, we have uh, 500 installations and we have 501 profiles <laughs> um so th- what basically wh- what we try to do is is uh, uh in in the last five or six years, we, we collected a huge amount of data and uh, introducing the machine learning and t- try to basically control the battery uh, and, and doing uh, it's overused smart algorithms that uh, maximizing the battery life. For example, uh, there's no point to charge up the battery to 100% SOC at night if you know that you're not going to discharge it till 3 p.m. Right, so keep it in fifty percent SOC, which which is the the optimum, and you know that you can charge it up in maybe two hours. So you start to charge it at one o'clock, actually, which helps the dock. Right now, it's we still have issue that usually at the one o'clock the uh, rates and things like that. But th- that kind of algorithm uh, to introducing, and that can extend the, the battery life. Okay. Um, and the other thing is that uh, keeping tab on that how much you used or the total the total energy throughput and uh, when we're talking about the virtual power plant right we have many properties that again just we can take a look that this battery already had uh, a thousand cycles that battery had only uh, 800 cycles so let's use more of that battery than this one <coughs> Yeah, I mean, I just want to follow up on that. It's a great example because you know, I lead a strategy and analytics team, and so some several data scientists on my team kind of looked at some historical data and operations. Um, I wouldn't say with STEM, but with a, you know, a comparable company in that space, and we found it could be way better in, in terms of optimizing the the usage given the the, the signals than what the, was happening with with the customer deployment in the customer battery. So again, it goes back to technology, and then kind of there we can get even better, you know, lower cost with um, permitting and, and so there are things we do to squeeze out efficiencies you know using machine learning techniques and so forth it's, it's actually very promising and exciting hi Amber Kerr UC Berkeley um, I hope I didn't miss it correct me if I'm wrong but I don't think you mentioned the California Public Utilities Commission mandate for certain storage um, capacities um, in the investor owned utilities um, I was alluding to that when I talked about California policy. Oh, you were alluding yeah, so to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So my my understanding is that currently CPUC um, has mandated that utilities have, what is it, 1,325 megawatts of storage, and they just added a new requirement for 500 megawatts of, quote, unquote, behind the meter storage. Yes, PG's right? requirement is 747 megawatts total from those two programs. That's right. Seven hundred For PG&E. Oh, PG&E, yeah. right. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So I wanted to ask all of you, especially Mr. Strauss, do you um, believe that CPUC is on the right track in making this mandatory? Do you feel it's a useful yes. um, way to put the right pressure on the system, or do you feel that it is premature given the states of the technologies involved? And we already established there's no commissioners here, so speak freely. Let, let sure. me let me answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so it goes back to... What is California trying to do with climate change, right? California is about 1.5% of the world's emissions, right? And so, you know, it's basically saving some, you know, greenhouse gases and avoiding it in California. Does that make a difference? And so, yes, but it's also what we do sets examples for China and India and the world, and that's California's ambition, you know, and it's not just Jerry Brown's ambition, that's California's ambition. Okay. Um, and so when we think about storage, it's California's ambition to basically transform the market. How to do that? What's the best way to do that? You know, as a matter of general policy, PG tries to avoid, you know, placing mandates, right, on our procurement and, and activities, right? That looks like another constraint, which, you know, basically doesn't necessarily yield the optimal in the eight dimensional space. Right in terms of efficiency as well, so there there are probably better other ways to do it, you know. But uh, given that policy, you know, we're out there trying to figure out how best to to meet it in a low cost way, but also in a great learning way. In fact, one of the challenges is the mandate is in actually in terms of megawatts, not kilowatt hours, 
mm-hmm. which is, you know, uh, the key element. So it's like, so even the, the, the metric units for how this mandate was set up, you know, it's like, mm, there's some other things that could be even better, right? Um, but overall, it's like, let's take a step in that direction. What's the right size step? You know, and so is 747 megawatts for PGE by 2024. Is that too big a step? You know, it goes back to, to rough estimate might be for every three kilowatts or megawatts, I'll keep it utility scale, of solar PV in the system, maybe might need a megawatt of battery. Okay, might be other kinds of storage, and so, but let's say roughly three to one. So if you think about the kinds of quantities we're talking about, we're talking thousands and thousands, right, of additional megawatts of batteries. So you know what's the the right step? So you know that's a judgment call at this point. I accept the policy. PG will comply, and we're trying to do it in a way that makes a lot of sense for the learning, as well as the cost. Okay. Just a quick comment on on that. One of the things that I'm that fascinates me is how you go about mandating and and causing these things to happen behind the meter. And right now, the primary thing that we're seeing is that California is by far the number one consumer of storage, um, as Todd mentioned, and uh, it's because of uh, uh, the S chip program. So right, right now, there is a right. very very positive. Uh, benefit to installing behind the meter storage and people are responding to it very very clearly how that fits in with what the cpuc intends for us uh is 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 a little arcane but it but it is what is happening right now yeah so we're uh, we're at the end of our time unfortunately there's w- one more question okay, yeah, this will be a quick one and it'll, it'll give you a chance to speculate <laughs> with all the electrification of transportation and all the talk about vehicle to grid storage i want to hear you comment on the economic model of using vehicles for this kind of load storage, given that someone who buys a car and buys the battery may have a different economic incentive than a utility operator who wants to use it for storage and cycling. So I hope you'll think about what models make sense for this. And, you know, I'll I'll, I'll give them a pause so you can think about it for a moment. But clearly it's like there's a marketplace model, right, in which basically you have, uh, you know, a a variety of kinds of actors buying and selling voluntarily to do that exchange. And so, you know, what might that look like when folks are not mandated to provide that battery storage energy at times? What price signals are needed there? Or, you know, Again, to the extent we're talking about technologies, what codes and standards or technological devices. So there are a variety of kinds of policy levers that might be able to be done there. But that clearly is a huge potential, right, when we think about two-way bat flow from storage and transportation. You know, huge, huge potential. And the question is how to tap it technologically, how to ta- tap it kind of sociologically, institu- politically, institutionally, um, and, and how to kind of make it work for customers in a market system. So, okay. um, yeah, so there's, from my point of view, there's, there's two dimensions to that. The first one is actually very easy to solve conceptually, but it's going to take a while, which is creating standard so that uh, uh, the utility can interact with it with the car, right? So the the reality is that uh, bolts don't speak the same language as Tesla's, don't speak the same language as Nissan's. Uh, getting all of that sorted out, this is what uh, organizations like the IEEE do for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So we will get that sorted out. The next problem is is actually a more interesting one from my point of view. Remember, I was saying that to get into smart energy, you have to make it very seamless for the consumer. Um, so the very practical use case is, you know, I have my Tesla, I go to work in the morning, I come back, there's some excess energy in my car. Am I willing to, uh, um, to forgo the opportunity to go out at 10 o'clock for whatever reason? I would go out at 10 o'clock at night, uh, in order to power my house because I've been incented by a very, very powerful time of use, uh, uh, rate structure that says that it's going to be a lot cheaper for me to discharge my car than it is for me to buy it off of the grid or, or better yet, even to take that energy that's in my car and give it back to the grid. Um, trying to come up with a way to understand the use patterns uh, and people's tolerance is going to take some time, but uh, but it's a very obvious use is vehicle to, vehicle to grid, and we just have to figure it out. Anders, any final thoughts? It, in, in my point, is theoretically, it's a great idea in 2018. Uh, I don't see that it's going to have a, a broad, widely accepted application in the next four to five years. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for staying even a little bit longer. Glad we interested you. Please thank the panel.